Well, Father, we just thank you this morning, Father, for your presence. We thank you this morning for your word. And Father, I stand on the promise of your word that it, that it will not return to you void, Father, but it's going to accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And Father, we proclaim this morning that the word is being sent out into all the earth and that it will accomplish those things that you have in your heart, Father. Not our desires, but your desires, that which is in the, the, in the heart of our Messiah. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would make real to us today as we get into your word. Father, let it transform, let it empower the remnant for the days that are ahead. And we ask this in Jesus' name. As uh, I approached this this week, I really struggled. Should I preach a Hanukkah message or should I uh, continue on with the coming shaking? And the coming shaking, shaking uh, kind of won out because I think in a sense they're, they're in a, the one and the same. If you have your Bibles today, I want to go to Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to pick up with verse 18. We have been discussing a lot of things of, of how God is calling us to hear his voice, that uh, God wants us to move on. He doesn't want us to be as Esau. He wants us to be as Jacob. And even though we have times of wrestling with Almighty God, that we're going to end up having a new walk, a fresh walk, where we become a prince of God like, uh, the, like Israel. I want to pick up here in verse 18, for ye have not come unto the mount that can be touched, that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the sound of words, which voice they heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it was stoned and th or thrust through with a dart, and was so terrible unto the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly fearful and quaked. And so he's, he's dealing with how Israel came to a place that after they were set free from Pharaoh, that God, that Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, brought them to Mount Sinai. And God kind of showed out for them at Mount Sinai that the mountain was on fire, that he shook the mountain, that he spoke to them directly. And to be truthful, they freaked out. It was so much that even here the writer of Hebrews says that Moses was fearful and, and he did quake. And the response of the children of Israel is, I'm not going to hear your voice. You know what? If someone's going to quake and get freaked out, let's just let Moses do it. And so, God, here, here's the deal, God. You talk to Moses, Moses talks to us, and whatever he says, that's great. But how many know that wasn't that way when you read through the book of Exodus? Every time you turn around, Moses said this, and they said, nah, we don't want to do that. But I, I want to show you some things. You see, on that mountain, God manifested his presence. He showed them his power and his absolute holiness. But they, they desired, there was a desire of God when he spoke to them. They, they basically failed a test. And they repeated it again and again and again while they were wandering in the wilderness. And finally they got to the river Jordan. God said, go cross. They refused and they wandered in the wilderness until they died. But I want to go to Exodus chapter 19. I want to show you the heart of what God wants to do. What I have found about God is God has his plan. I call it plan A. He always has a plan A, and we try to get him to do plan B because it's easier on our flesh. And God may allow us to have that plan B for a time, but he will always take us back to plan A. We see this in many things throughout the Word of God. One of them was he said, you know what, Israel, every seventh year you're going to let the land rest. That's my plan. After a while, they got tired of doing that. Israel missed 70 sabbatical years. So what did God do? God took them under Nebuchadnezzar, took them out of the land, and they were absent for 70 years because God says, you're going to do it the easy way or the hard way. But God always takes them back to plan A. And the northern tribes went, went well, I think it was like over 300 and something, the exact number kind of has slipped my mind right now. But God took them in, into Assyria and took them for all those years because they had missed that many sabbatical years. God says, here's my plan A. And they said, no, God, I have plan B. And God says, you know what? You're in covenant with me. I'm God. You're not. I'm going to, I'm going to make you go ahead and do plan A. And so we see here in, in Exodus chapter 19, God has a plan A, starting with verse 4. 
Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and now I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you out unto myself. Now therefore ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant. Then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me from all, above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Underline that in your Bible. This is God's plan A. You're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. This was God's plan A. But they get to Mount Sinai that we read here in the book of Hebrews. God shows out for them. They all freak out and they reject the voice of God. You cannot be a priest and reject the voice of God. And so what God had to do is, well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the tribe of Levi unto myself. Now, those that are just simply Levites are going to minister to you for me, and they're going to teach you Torah. But of the, of the, of the, the sons of Aaron, the Kohanim, I'm going to set them to minister unto me. So this is, this is my temporary plan B until I can fix this, because right now you cannot bear my voice. But then we have Peter, and let's go to 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. He's going back, and he is re-expressing what God just shared here in Exodus. Because of Messiah, we go back to plan A. Aren't you glad? But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now you have attained mercy. And I, I was watching a... Um, virtual Bible conference, and they were kind of wrestling with Peter because at the beginning of 1 Peter, he says that he is speaking to the strangers scattered abroad, which are the Jewish people that were scattered abroad. And so they said, we need to be kind of careful because all of, of, of 1 Peter is dealing just for the Jewish believers. But yet he's not. There's a principle over and over again that the Apostle Paul shared. But let, let's look first at Peter. Peter was given the keys of the kingdom, which gave him the ability to open up the kingdom to peoples. And at first, on the day of Pentecost, he opened up the gospel. He opened up the kingdom to the Jewish people. Then later on, we find he ends up at the house of a Gentile that was a devout man, that he was a God-fearer, that he kept the Torah, he was eating kosher, he was doing all these things. He just didn't go, he just wasn't circumcised because he never took that final step. Those are what are called God-fears. And so the, the Almighty God set, sets a vision to Peter that, listen, I'm getting ready to do this to Gentiles, and the vision of Peter had nothing to do with what you put on your table to eat. It has everything to do that we Gentiles can come in the kingdom without circumcision because it's circumcision of heart. And so Peter then opens up the gospel to the Gentiles who immediately believe and immediately receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, so much so that even Peter is astonished. And so there's a principle we see both in Peter and in Paul's writings that the gospel is first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And so as Peter touches on both these because he opened the kingdom to both. We see in 1 Peter 1 and 2, he says, Now, Peter, an apostle of Christ, and to the strangers scattered abroad. And so he's dealing with all the Jews scattered abroad. But when you study church history and you study the Bible, it wasn't just the Jews scattered. The Gentiles scattered with them. When they, when the, with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that eventually they moved the, the, basic, the, the headquarters, if you will, of the early church from Jerusalem to Antioch. Antioch was a Gentile city. And so the Gentile support team kind of moved with them, even so much so that when it was time to send the Apostle Paul out, it was from there that he was sent out into the Gentiles. And so he goes on, and, and listen to the terminology here on, in, in verse 2 of Second uh, Peter 1. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, and to the obedience and sprinkling of 
the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace be multiplied. He's using terminology about the elect, about the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. This is the exact same terminology that the Apostle Paul uses for the Gentiles, like in the book of Ephesians. But he even connects it here in 1 Peter 2, where he deals about your being a royal priesthood. And listen to this, he says, which in times past were not a people, but are now a people. That's the Gentiles. That is the very same promise the Apostle Paul said. Those of you who were far away, were not a people, have now been drawn near by the blood of Christ. You've now been engrafted into the people. And so he is saying, listen, both Jew and Gentile, because of Messiah, you are being brought into it, becoming a holy spiritual nation. And that you are a royal priesthood. That all of us have been entered into the priesthood. In fact, in uh, Revelation 1, 5, and 6, we find this, and, and this is what the Apostle Paul, or Apostle John, bears witness of. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that showed us and uh, that loved us and washed us in his own blood, he hath made us kings and priests unto God, the, unto God and unto his Father." Now, what I, everybody I, I see running around because this is actually a very poor interpretation of the Greek. And, you know, people don't like it when you correct the King James, but in a few places the King James needs to be tweaked just a little bit. And so everybody runs, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. No, that's not actually what he's saying here. Now, listen to this out of the complete Jewish Bible. And from Yeshua the Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, who to him who loved us, who has freed us from our sins at the cost of his blood, and who has caused us to be a kingdom that is koanim, the priests that were able to minister to God. He's very specific here, and, and Dr. Stearns actually interpreted this right. We did, we're not become Levites. We have become the new Kohanim after the order of Melchizedek. Unto his father, we have become a nation of Kohanim, a nation of priests, a nation of priests that are not rejecting the voice of God, but because we, Jesus said, my sheep hear my what? Hear my voice. We're required to hear the voice of God. We're also required to obey the voice of God. And the voice of God is first found in his word, starting in Genesis and ending in the book of Revelation. And God never contradicts himself. God never corrects himself. There is, there is a uniqueness of the word that, that there is a continuity through it from beginning to end. And I, I'm, I'm tired of many preachers the way that they preach uh, New Testament living, that we, there, is a, there is a disconnect between the Old and New Testament, and that is made by man, it's not made by God. You know, when Je I've heard one guy say, Jesus said, I'm supposed to obey his commandments. If you let me keep my commandments, so it's all the commandments of the New Testament, you just violated about seven hermeneutical principles. The principle first mentioned, God has already defined what his commandments are. Then when you find out that Jesus is encoded into yod heh vav -Heh, that, that Yahweh is a representation of Jesus and is a prophetic symbol of Jesus. In fact, even the psalmist said under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that Yahweh has become my Yeshua. It was Yahweh that came. Even under the old covenant, Yahweh was a knowable aspect of Almighty God. The ancient of days, the rabbis teach, is the unknowable, but the Son of Man was the knowable. It was Jesus that gave the commandments to Moses. It was Jesus that freed them from the Pharaoh. It was Jesus that parted the Red Sea. It was Jesus that poured out the plagues, just like it's going to be Jesus pouring out the plagues in Revelation. Same thing. So he has called us to be priests. Now let's pick up back here in Hebrews chapter 12. Because I have said the last three messages to get to here. Now are ye coming to Mount Zion. Mount Zion, you don't have to freak out. It's not scary like Mount Sinai. But I, I want to show you some things. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and unto an innumerable company of angels. How many are glad that the angels of God are there and the angels of God are busy doing his will? You didn't see those on Mount Sinai. 
You just saw the consuming fire of who God is. And to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's a whole teaching right there which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirit of just men made perfect. Now, I want to present something before you. We, the way that we teach grace in the church today, they, they feared and they trembled when they saw God at Mount Sinai, but we think we can just stroll into Mount Zion and we have less responsibility. But the way the book of the writer, the writer of Hebrews puts this, I propose that we have a greater responsibility. We saw more. All they saw was the mountain of God, and they saw it shake, and they saw it trembled, and they heard his voice, and it freaked them out, and they didn't see anything else. Now we have come into Mount Zion, that spiritual mountain, that we not only see the living God, we see the very city of the living God. We see all the angels. We see the great assembly, the great cloud of witness that was before us, now, let me tell you something. Saints in the past, you know, I think with every generation, we're supposed to get stronger. When I see the book of Acts, just the book of Acts, the modern-day believer can't hold a candle to where they were in the book of Acts. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. But he goes on to say, the God who is the judge of all, I get to stand before the judge. That is both an exhilarating and a frightening thing. But then he goes on to say, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, that Greek word there for perfect is tele uh oh. And you say uh oh when you realize the standard that you're supposed to have. Grace is not an excuse not to mature, grace is God's accelerant to help you mature. This perfect here, tele uh oh, means to make perfect complete, to carry through, uh, through completely, to accomplish, to finish, to bring to an end, to be whole. It's almost the same word, it, it, the Greek version of the same word when God told Moses, come before me and be thou perfect. In other words, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you into who you should be. And he said, listen, we go to Mount Zion, it's not just God. Now, we don't have the shaking right now of the mountain. We don't have the fire of the mountain right now that might freak you out. But you know what? The grace of God allows us to go beyond Mount Sinai to see Mount Zion, to see the holy city of God, to see those that have gone on before us that have reached perfection, to see the, whole, the holy God who is the judge of all the earth, to see all the angels. To me, that means that God is requiring more of us. God didn't lower the bar because of the cross. He raised the bar. God is requiring more of us while we're using grace to lower the bar and make excuses. Jesus is raising the bar. And he said, not just that, guys. We and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling and the, to the blood of sprinkling, which speaks better things of Abel. Do you know the blood of Jesus speaks a whole lot more of you than you require yourself? While Abel's blood cried out for revenge, Jesus' blood cries out for your sanctification. It cries out for your maturing. It cries out for you to meet the standard, and the standard is Jesus. How can we say that we follow him and don't do the things that he did? Does anybody see Jesus calling the Sunday Sabbath? Do we ever see Jesus gathering around and say, hey, guys, this is, this is December 25th. I know all the Romans are celebrating Saturnalia, but guess what? This is my birthday, and I want to have a party. We don't see any of those things in the Word of God. He kept all the feasts because the feasts are about him. There were, there were things that God set into motion, not Babylon. And God is calling us to keep those. He is the standard. He is the mediator. And it's by his blood that we now have acceptance to the Father, but our responsibility to mature and to serve as proper priests in his service are now ours. If I am called to be a Kohenim where I can go into his presence and minister directly to him, that's a higher standard than what they had in the Old Testament. Now, Mike, how can you say all that? Let's read verse 25. 
See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Underline that in your Bible. You see, at Mount Sinai, they refused him. God, what you're saying is too hard. What you're saying is too scary. And now he's saying, listen, you have come to Mount Zion, not Mount Sinai. You cannot have an excuse to refuse his voice. No excuse. While we go around saying grace is the reason that I cannot hear, I don't have to hear the voice of God, but he's going to give me all these blessings anyway. You're deceived. It's I hear his voice, I keep his commandments, therefore the blessings flow, because that's the way covenant always operates. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if he if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth. Guys, how many died in the wilderness because God said cross over the Jordan? How many of them died and didn't cross over? All of them. All of them. Joshua and Caleb said, we're more than able to take land. I'm ready to take down some Nephilim. I'm, I, I, I tell you what, he may be 12 foot tall, but it's, you know, I'll get on Joshua's shoulders and we'll take that bad boy down. It doesn't matter. Because Almighty God was with them. They're the only two out of that entire group that made it across. And now, here the writer of Hebrews is saying, you better not refuse the voice of God that's speaking. And right now, God is speaking a thing. He is speaking a thing of maturity. He is, he, he is calling us to come out of Babylon. I think he has to do that with every generation. I think there's a shaking that comes with every generation for the sake of the remnant. And the final shaking, how many knows the book of Revelation? You get in the book of Revelation, there's all kinds of shaking going on. But unless you as a generation know how to yield to the shaking of God in your generation and hear the voice of him who speaks, you're not going to make it through. One of the things in, in the dialogue that I, some of the dialogue that I had going on with uh, Facebook this week, I finally had it and I said, you know what, it's time to put on our big boy pants. Let's quit trying to explain away the word and start doing the word. Let's start hearing the voice of God and doing the voice of God. And I tell you what, the first thing he's going to do, how many want to be empowered by God? The first thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a hammer and a nail. And he's going to say, you want my power, you better learn how to crucify the flesh. Quit using my gospel and the grace of God as an excuse. It's supposed to empower you to get rid of that stuff so I can put on my newness in Christ. And my newness in Christ is an obedient son, is an obedient daughter who is faithful in my priesthood. And I will do what he says to do, no matter how much, the, if the world says go left and Almighty God says go right, I will be that strange critter that goes right and leaves the herd behind because a herd mentality will send you right to the butcher it always does i choose to follow the shepherd never the butcher it says see that ye refuse not him that speaketh for if they escape not who refused him that speaketh on earth how much more how much more how much or much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh on the earth the blood of the body of Christ is beginning to wake up to the fact that we're going to be going through most of the tribulation period. Now, I heard Rob Skiba on a video last night. He says, I think Babylon's going to be destroyed in one day, so all the bowls are going to be poured out in one day. I, I tend to believe they're going to be poured out in 10 days during the 10 days of awe. So for you, the tribulation period is shortened by 10 days. Our job is to make it until the very ultimate feast of trumpets where that last trumpet sounds. The only way that you're going to make it is you got to heed the voice of him who speaks. One of the things that we find out in nations like in communist Russia, do you know how a lot of believers thrived and survived in the same thing in China? God would say, go here, and they go here. God would say, don't go there, and don't go there. I've talked to Russians 
that said, you know, how do you guys, because one of the things that, that we asked, you know, I, I was a GI, a young GI in, in the military, and we had some guys come over. I was, I was stationed in, in Würzburg, and so we had some guys kind of were able to get out of Russia and were, were, were sharing with the missionaries, and they said, and I said, you know, how did, how did you guys broadcast that you had church and, 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 the, uh, and the KGB didn't find out about it? He just smiled. They said we told them to pray. We knew they were believers. If they could hear the voice of God, and they knew where and when because it was always different places at different times. And if you could hear and show up, you were following his voice, therefore you were a believer. I tell you what, guys, we put on billboards, this is the time of our service, and 90% of the saints can't make it to service across the body of Christ. They put it on church signs, I've seen ministries that are frustrated. It's like, we gave you bulletins, we, we, we mailed you direct mail mailings, we texted you, we emailed you, and then your excuse was, I didn't know when the meeting was. How about removing all that? You pray, God will give you the time and the place, and we'll find out really if you're walking with God or not if you show up. I tell you what, that's when you're going to start dealing with just the remnant. And God is saying, if you're going to, if, we're, if each one of us, if we and our families are going to make it, if we're going to find that secret place of the Most High God, it's got to be, I've got to wipe away all the excuses. I've got to hear him and obey him. Oh, let's pick up here verse 26. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now hath he promised, saying, yet, once more, I will not only shake the earth, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things which are shaken as of things which are, that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. That's what you see through the book of Revelation. You see, one of the reasons why things are going to get so hot and heavy in the book of Revelation right now we have, we, now there, there are demons on planet earth, but all the principalities and power, and Lucifer himself is the God of the air. He's in that second heaven, if you will. God's going to clear that place and drive them all to earth. We see in the book of Revelation, he's come down, and he's now raffled because now it's, it's, it's now that he has been kicked out of the second heaven. And by the way, I think he has been kicked out of his access to the third heaven. He can no longer be the accuser of the brethren before the throne. God says, you know what? I had enough for you. Don't let the door hit you where I split you. I've had it. I've had it. My saints are finally grown up, and they have started praying the right things. And now their prayers are coming up, and they're accusing you. Which gives me the legal right to tell you there's the door. Once that happens, we see that in the book of Revelation, that is when all hell breaks loose. And all of a sudden you see Apollyon being raised from the pit and this transugenic whore being released that cannot touch those who have the name of God in them. But those that have the mark of the beast get tormented to the place that even though that, and there's a possibility that those that have received that they either have extended lives or there's some of the very elite that could actually re have reached mortal immortality without God when you understand what transhumanism is trying to do. And now God says these things afflict them to the place that they wish that they could die and can't, that death won't even touch them. That's why the book of Revelation says there's some of them that will be thrown alive into the lake of fire when Jesus comes back. But he's telling us we have got to learn, get rid of the excuses that when God does a shaking in my life, it is to shake away, rattle away the things that aren't of him that I have taken comfort from Babylon. And as I listen to him, I will have things established in me that cannot be shaken. Now, I have said all this to finally get to verse 28. Wherefore we receiving, now it's not past tense, it's present tense in the continuous state. So as I heed his voice and obey his voice, I am in the process of receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Come on. 
The devil didn't give it. The devil can't take it away. The devil can't touch this. The more that God speaks when I hear his voice, the more that I am established in that kingdom. So what we have got to say is, Father, I want to hear your voice. I wa- Correct me, Holy Ghost. I, I want to be a son. I don't-, I don't want to be an illegitimate child. I want to hear your voice. Correct me where I need to be corrected. Christians do not like to be corrected today. The moment you try to correct them, I'll tell you what, I'll take my tie somewhere else. Good. I would rather have 20 remnant than 2,000 rebellious children. Now, you can build a pretty good-sized church with the rebellious children, but what you end up doing is you start doing the same thing that got the Levites judged. In the book of Malachi, they preached what the people wanted to hear, not what the people needed to hear. And we have a lot of ministries today that are built around what the people want to hear. We have apologists that are protecting what the people want to hear. You better be worried about what Almighty God wants decreed. It says, wherefore we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace. Grace enables you to move in that kingdom that cannot be moved. Grace is not an excuse not to hear the voice of God. It is the supernatural ability to hear his voice and then an anointing to do what he's telling you to do. Boy, have we perverted grace in modern theology today. We look at the Jews in the Old Testament and said, man, they had a tight line that they had to walk. Let me tell you something. When God opens your eyes and you actually see what's going on, they had an 18-lane highway compared to what we got to walk. They, could, they rejected the voice of God. They couldn't hear the voice of God. They had to yield to when a prophet would come or, or a priest would come and share. I'm directly connected to my king. I can come boldly before the throne of grace in a time of need. I can have God correct me directly. And if, he doesn't, and if I won't allow him to correct me directly, don't be griping at him when all hell breaks loose in your life because he says, well, if you won't let me correct you, I'll just let the devil do it. I'll get you to the place that you wish you hadn't gone where you wanted to go. You're like Lot. The angel says, I want you to go here. And he goes, oh, no, I don't want to go there. I want to go over here because it's a little easier. He goes over there and he says, dear God, I should have done what the angel told me to begin with. I'm going to go back over here where he told me to go. How about always settling? When God tells you something, say, Father, I want plan A. I don't want to go through the wilderness of plan B. You see, there's a lot of the remnant right now that could have been the remnant that were active and powerful 20, 30 years ago, but they chose plan B because everybody else was. But now that God is shaking them saying, I have called you to be the remnant. Quit going with the flow of Babylon. Come out of Babylon and get established because I want to give you, you see, everything of Babylon, that kingdom is going to be wiped away. It's going to fall in one day. That 5,000 years, the enemy has been building this thing, and God's going to take it out in one day, what you connected to. I want to be connected to that kingdom that cannot be shaken. That's what God is calling us to. He says, whereby we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be removed, let us have grace that we may serve God acceptably. Acceptable to who? The Baptists, the Assemblies of God, the Charismatics, the Pentecostals, the Dominionists. Who are we supposed to be acceptable to? Heaven, to Almighty God, that comes in line not only with his throne as judge, but with heaven, with that holy city, with all the angels and those that have gone on to perfection before us. Do you know what really makes a a, a good praise and worship service? Well, it, it, you know, we say, well, it's when, you know, Michael gets on the stick and he sings the right songs. No. It's when the songs and the state of our heart come into line with what's going on in heaven and heaven and earth match. When, when God is saying, this is what I'm doing and we enter in because we're following the Holy Spirit, when earth lines up with heaven, there is a conduit established and the power can flow. 
But as long as we're doing our own thing over here and heaven is lined up somewhere else, you can never get that connection. Now, you may, have a, you may have a good cry fest. You may have some emotional release. But I am tired of seeing people, historically I've seen for, for decades, that have this big emotional release at the altar. They'll go and they'll, they'll cry and they'll wail and, they'll, and you know, it's just one big snot ball from one end to the other. Or they'll, they'll jump and they'll leap and everything else. But when they leave the church service, they're in the exact same position they were when they got there. You did not connect with heaven. You connected with your emotions it was a solical exchange, and you, you had a bunch of emotions that may have been some psychological thing that the devil pulled on your emotions, but you weren't connected with heaven because if you connected with heaven, you'd walked out of there completely different. You would have wrestled with God and yielded, and he would have changed your walk the same way that Jacob moved from the conniver to the prince of God. And from that day forward, his walk was different. But it says we have got to serve God acceptably. Uh-oh. Look at the rest of this. It's almost like we're at Mount Sinai with reverence and godly fear. Because here's the reality. The Jews had, within Torah had a, had, a, had a wide berth that they could, they could go, and Babylon was either side of them. But what did Jesus say? He talked to those who had this kind of path, and he said, Narrow is the way. He talked to those that were used to walk in that 16-lane highway that was Torah, and he said, you know what, with what I'm getting ready to do, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Now I'm not going to put my spirit in you. Then I'm going to move you beyond the written Torah because now my, the purpose of my spirit is to write my Torah, the same Torah that Moses gave, on your hearts so that you do it from here so that when you read the commandments of God that your heart is in alignment with what I have written. And so the pathway went, whoop. And what, what we're being taught is that the New Testament church now has a 147-lane highway because of grace. But yet Jesus says, why is the path that leads to destruction, not Mount Zion? Brother, you had to bring up the word. You just had to bring up the principles of God. Yes, I did. Because this is his stuff, not your stuff. I want to move in that kingdom that cannot be shaken. I want to get to the place where I'm recession-proof, I'm plague-proof, I'm pestilence-proof. There's a level that we can walk that we're not walking in, but you have to mature to that place by yielding to the process. And we, we have got to come back to the place that my service to God is acceptable because I do it with reverence to him and godly fear. Why? Let's look at the very last verse here in Hebrews 12. He brings us back full circle. For our God is a consuming fire. You know why I think the brighter Hebrews did that? Because he said, you know what? He said, you don't understand with what's coming. God shook Mount Sinai. He showed out to the place that even Moses, the one, Moses called down plagues on Pharaoh. Moses held out his rod, and he saw God split the Red Sea. But when he got to Mount Sinai, he was expecting this little burning bush. It's like, come on, come on boys. I, I, want you to show, I want you to see this, this burning bush. Man, that's really cool. And he got up there, and God showed him a burning mountain. And Moses quaked and trembled and said, I'm exceedingly fearful. When we get to the book of Revelation, God takes this planet and the second heaven where all the principalities and powers are, and he shakes them all. And while he's shaking them, he says, what I'm doing, Christian, is I'm giving you a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I will only shake Babylon. And if you come out of Babylon, you're going to be receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. For our God is a consuming fire. How much is he a consuming fire? That one day after the millennial reign, and I believe in a literal millennial reign, we are, the, the kingdom of God today is not about taking control of government. 
Now, it's, it's beneficial if you have righteous men walking with God in government, But what I have found, and what is biblically true, is if men are walking right with God and walking in reverential fear, you don't have to have 10 million laws on the books. They self-govern according to the word of God. Only men that are not walking with God, that have a heart of rebellion, do do you need to have 10 million laws on the books. And what God wants to do is if he wins the heart, the kingdom of God is established within the heart and then within that individual's life and that within his family and that we are called to live in community of like-minded believers so the kingdom of God can be established there. But the only time the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ is when he destroys Babylon and he comes back and he physically rules and reigns in Jerusalem. And the word of God is quite clear. He's going to reign there for a thousand years. After he's done with this, our God who is a consuming fire will consume this universe. One first time by water, next time by fire. But I mean absolutely everything in this universe. As far as our our greatest telescopes can see, it's not just just our solar system. It's not just our spiral galaxy in which we live. But it's in this entire dimensional reality that we call the universe will cease to exist. And God will create a new universe that has never been touched by sin. And he will create a new earth many, many, many times larger than the earth that we're living on now. Because if he would bring down the new Jerusalem on planet earth now, most of the floors would be above our atmosphere. Bigger planet. Different physics in this universe. You don't need a sun to shine. But if you have a box and you close up that box, light's still shining in that box. I just, I want to see that. Can't see my shadow no matter what because I don't have a shadow. Because all darkness has been removed from this universe. Not only sin and the kingdom of darkness, but the literal concept of the absence of light is gone. That's compelling to me. So God is calling us. And we, we got to... Uh, I remember... When Mary, when she came out of her depression and she was learning how to hear the voice of God, she was determined that she was going to hear it. And one of the things she says, I'm a sheep and I'm not a goat. And she wrestled and wrestled and wrestled until she got herself aligned with heaven. And let me tell you something. That's something all of us have to do. Some of us hear the voice of God easily. And some of us have been so aligned before we got saved that we're still tuned in to, to you know, Channel 666, Babylon Express, you know, Babylon Radio. We're still tied into that frequency, and we've got to crucify the flesh and wrestle to the place that Jesus aligns us back with heaven because hearing his voice is key and then being obedient to that voice so that we can receive that kingdom that will not be shaken. I don't know if the tribulation is going to start tomorrow or if it starts in another 30 years. What is crucial for this generation is that we have got to learn now to start hearing his voice. You want to be established in the kingdom of God that cannot be shaken before the shaking starts happening, the ultimate shaking. And God, give us your ability, your grace to enter into that kingdom. Let us shirk off Babylon and reject anything that smells of Babylon and only line ourselves up with words. Solus scriptoris. And we are called out of the kingdom of darkness and everything associated with it into the kingdom of light. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I ask that you would loose an anointing on us today. Father, we choose to enter into Mount Zion. And Father, we ask right now that the blood of sprinkling, the blood of Jesus would cover every place in our lives. Father, that it would cover every doorway. Father, that it would cover our mistakes. That it would cover our misalignment with the kingdom. And Father, I ask right now for grace that every place the blood goes, that the grace of God would realign us to heaven and heaven alone. We want to hear not the voice of the flesh, not the voice of Babylon, but the voice of our Father who is in heaven. And Father, we ask that you would give us the grace to hear and that you would then give us the power of your spirit to obey your voice and your word. Father, speak to us in our prayer closets. And Father, I ask right now that a fresh anointing would come on all of us, that you would speak to us out of your word, that the word of God would become alive to our hearts and that our spirit men would soak it up 
and receive strength to walk in this new kingdom. And Father, we thank you, we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.